Clash of the Red Rangers was originally released direct to DVD, presented as a movie, even though it's really just two episodes. Technically, I shouldn't be talking about this for a little while longer, since while this is considered a movie connected with the first season, certain power-ups and characters featured in it are from season two. But it was released between seasons, and, well, might as well talk about it here. The movie begins with confirmation that RPM did indeed exist in a parallel universe. What's more, we see the RPM's Megazord having a Western-style duel with one of Vengex's generals, Professor Cog. The thing to note about this story is that, thanks to the other-dimensional nature of RPM, it takes place in the middle of RPM rather than after it. However, this duel started, it ends with the Megazord damaged but not out. For some reason, Cog decides not to finish the job, instead saying that he's off to another dimension to make a deal that will destroy humanity in two worlds. This is probably why Vengex never mentioned this guy, his rather stupid tendency to blab about his plans. Seriously, how the hell would the RPM Rangers know about this if not for this asshole blabbing about it? Anyway, it turns out the method of traveling from one dimension to another is... a subway car. Not a dimensional portal, not accelerating to unfathomable speeds, not even punching a wall, just... a subway car. I wonder if there's like a train schedule for this thing. <laughs> The train to the evil mirror universe is now boarding on platform one. Train to gender swap universe is now departing from platform six. Anyway, the Samurai Rangers encounter a Nylock that's spinning around destroying buildings. Nearby, Professor Cog observes the battle and follows the Nylock through a gap into the netherworld. Xandred has been working on things himself. He's amassed a massive Mooger army under the command of General Gut and plans to unleash it on Earth as soon as possible. However, Professor Cog arrives with an offer from Vengex. He wants Sanzu River Water to bring back to the RPM dimension, hoping to use in it to poison their Earth and kill off the remaining human population. While Xandred's army invades the city, Cog will use his forces to kill off the Samurai Rangers. Meanwhile, the subway train of plot convenience arrives again, bringing with it a figure in red. Oh, thank goodness Captain Marvel is here! The Rangers, getting ice cream after a successful day of... not defeating the Nylock, get interrupted. I always knew this would be the result of roundabouts. On the overpass, the Rangers find the grinders attacking people. Nylock with lasers? Those steampunks are Nylock. They're machines! That explains the sound! I don't know what it is about that line, but I am flummoxed by it. That explains the sound? That's the first weird thing about them that you noticed? Hell, you didn't even point out that you heard the noise first. It's like a line was cut here or something. But whatever, they fight the grinders and do okay for the most part, but they're fighting armored robots with samurai swords. Robots designed to hunt down and exterminate the human race, which was armed with laser guns and yet was able to be cut in half by a bus door. Oh, and speaking of... Why, hello there! Another ranger. <laughs> oh, what? Huh? What? Jaden? Jaden is standing right there, and his outfit only matches his in that it's red. Anyway, employing the Carter-Grayson technique for a bit, Scott is able to take out the grinders and comments that the group really needs to upgrade their weapons. The team demorphs and asks who the hell he is. Well, I'm a Power Ranger, just like you. But where I come from, they call me Ranger Red. Well, technically, they call you Ranger Operator Series Red, but why split hairs? Anyway, Scott properly introduces himself and explains that the grinders are from his universe. He says he can't demorph right now, saying he has his reasons for doing so, which creates a bit of distrust from the rangers. Well, the guys, anyway. Both the girls apparently want to <clears throat> get in gear, as it were. He's brought back to the command house, where he's a bit taken aback by the surroundings. What in the world? Uh... <laughs> you guys really do live a Spartan life, don't you? He explains about Professor Cog in his own world, but what's more, the reason he can't demorph is because he's afraid he won't be able to breathe the air in this dimension. Eh, I wouldn't worry just about air, but physical laws altogether when it comes from crossing from one universe to the next. Hell, it makes sense especially in Samurai, when we've already established that humans can't travel into the netherworld without becoming Nylocks, and Nylocks have difficulty staying in this universe without drying up. But yeah, Scott spends the entire time here morphed, and there are a few explanations that I've heard about that. One is that Eka Darville, who played Scott, couldn't be convinced to return to New Zealand for it, but was willing to do voiceover for it. 
making me scratch my head at the previous times where they could have gotten actors to do voiceovers, but whatever. Although a bit more logical reason, particularly because of how he's credited in the episode, is that Eka Darville had by that point joined the Screen Actors Guild. Power Rangers is notorious when it comes to union situations, it's complicated, but Darville had to go under a pseudonym to do the voiceover. And while it is sucky that he's not actually there for this, I think it actually works to the episode's benefit. After he goes to rest up, immediately the guys reiterate how they don't trust him. I've spoken before about reading too much into Power Rangers when it comes to themes like technology versus magic and stuff, but in particular how disappointed I was where there wasn't any team up between Mystic Force and SPD, seeing two very different Ranger teams with different abilities and power sources interacting and the conflict that could arise from those approaches. Clash of the Red Rangers is the first time we really see that kind of conflict brought to the center stage in an episode, as you can imagine by the title. Sure, Thunderstorm had two different Ranger teams fighting and had different styles to them, but it wasn't quite as prominent as it is here, where they literally come from two different worlds. Even if Scott wasn't from a post-apocalyptic world where Dr. K's technology was the only thing that could save them, the tech itself forms the basis of his everyday life. Cars, mechanics, electronics, engineering, all things that are different from the Samurai Rangers who embrace mystical symbol power, melee weapons, spiritual training, meditation. Power Ranger seasons can usually be divided into two forms, technological and spiritual, with Turbo, In Space, Light Speed, Time Force, Dino Thunder, SPD, Overdrive, and RPM fitting into the former, while Wild Force, Ninja Storm, Mystic Force, Jungle Fury, and Samurai fit into the latter. Both have their own strengths and weaknesses, and it's usually up to personal preference what a viewer would prefer. Mighty Morphin, Zeo, and Lost Galaxy tend to fit somewhere in between. While I contend Mighty Morphin will more often than not go for a technological solution to a problem, they had their fair share of mystical solutions as well upon reevaluation. The point being that this is really at the heart of the conflict in this episode, two incompatible worldviews having to work together. One from a world on the edge of annihilation, the other living in comfort but with an inherited duty and responsibility. It's far from perfect, I will admit, but I do enjoy the episode more as a result of this. Scott doesn't exactly endear himself to the other rangers when he takes G's motorcycle to the grinders, who are attacking Antonio's stunt double. Yeah, in an ironic twist, Steven Schuyler wasn't available for filming the crossover either, so they used a stand-in for him and his voiceovers. Whoops. Really, the only thing that bugs me, particularly when even Antonio wonders if that's Jaden at first, is that both the Rangers and G are confused by the presence of another Red Ranger, when they should know damn well there are other Ranger teams out there. This actually led to a fan theory that RPM took place in the main universe, and it was Samurai that took place in an alternate reality. Especially since at points they occasionally reference previous teams as if they were all Samurai Rangers. I don't buy into that fan theory, mainly because it overcomes complicates things, but Megaforce will confirm that RPM is in their own universe. Professor Cog shows up and hits the two Red Rangers with Hypno-Bolts, but what's more is that he's able to open up a dimensional vortex and shoot it at the two. However, the other Samurai Rangers step in and take the blast, getting sucked into the RPM universe. After the two Red Rangers are knocked into the water, Cog exposits that his Hypno-Bolts will make the two Rangers fight each other. We soon see that in action when Scott refuses a helping hand out of the water, and they discuss what happened. They protect me because they think I'm the key to stopping Master's Android. <laughs> oh, wow, you are pretty full of yourself, aren't you? And before you make judgments, take a look at yourself. Scott says that it's likely that if they're on his world now, the RPM Rangers will be assisting them. Unfortunately, we never get to see that. For whatever reason, most likely money, Scott is the only RPM Ranger we see. It's a real shame. I mean, I know they probably couldn't afford to rebuild the command garage, but just like how Scott clashed with the very simple surroundings of the Samurai Rangers, I would have loved to see how they deal with a full-scale lab and high-tech equipment. Hell, I could imagine Dr. K being fascinated by stuff like the symbol powers that Antonio had created, maybe try to copy the technology for their own stuff. Anyway, with the Samurai Rangers out of the way, Xandred and General Gut prepare to unleash their army onto Earth, Professor Cog already sending bucketfuls of Sanzu River water into the RPM universe. Back at the command house, the two start getting much more aggressive towards one another. The next day, upon detecting the gathering army, the two Red Rangers head out and have themselves a little dick measuring contest, Jaden riding away on a horse while Scott steals G's motorcycle again. Utilizing a shortcut, plus because his horse was created by magic, Jaden actually gets their 
first. The two begin clashing with each other despite Moogers and Grinders surrounding them. Actually, the fun thing is they start using the foot soldiers as fodder around them while they fight, and we soon learn that it was all a trick. G realized something was up with their behavior and used some symbol magic to heal them. Although what's interesting to me there is that G apparently has his own Samurizer. What's up with that? Oh, and enjoy Moogers on motorcycles. Really, the only problem is that things fall apart from here story-wise. There is no more story for the last 15 minutes of the episode. It's a fight scene. A really, really long fight scene. I'll admit it's a good one, lots of exciting fight stuff, and the other rangers returning with a message from the RPM rangers. Scott, your team says hi. But the problem is that it just goes on and on and on, especially kind of problematic because usually an army of this size would be in the finale of the season, but they're easily taken out. Monsters are defeated, foot soldiers killed, the Mooger army defeated, General Gut is killed. No! I won't see it end this way! Then you should close your eyes. Okay, that was badass. And I'm sure we'll never see Professor Cog again. They say farewell to Scott, who says privately to Mike, But hey, good luck with Emily. What? <laughs> I do have eyes under here, you know. I see the way she looks at you. Really? Because I haven't. Now, ah, well, I'm sure this will get followed up soon and not just be reserved for the season finale or something and lack any other buildup. As I've said, Clash of the Red Rangers is not bad. It's not great, and it very well could have been, but there have been much worse team-ups, and the conflict between Scott and the Samurai Rangers felt very natural. Even though RPM exists in a different universe, it's great to have that acknowledgement from the main universe that their fight did matter, and that they're just as worthy to stand alongside those from the main universe. After all, there was no pressing reason to do this crossover, so I appreciate the extra effort they seem to put into the story. That being said, we should probably get back to the series proper with Super Samurai, both the second season of the show and the first episode of that season. I wish I could say that something groundbreaking and different happened in it, but of course it didn't. This show was not meant to be separated into two seasons. Only two things of note occur here. One, Sanzu River water is now openly beginning to enter the earth in puddles. Uh, might want to get a sponge or something if it does that to a twig. And two, they finally unlock the black box. More on that in a second, but what really gets me is that apparently there was a memo or something lost because there's a big continuity error within the first five minutes. In the previous two proper episodes, there was a monster Nylock who wanted to usurp power from Master Xandred. After he failed, Master Xandred deliberately mutated him to become more powerful and insane, with the intention of sending him out to Earth. And now at the beginning of this episode, Xandred apparently forgot that he was the one who did this and complains about how treacherous the monster is and how he doesn't care to hear about how he mutated or anything. Maybe his headache is caused by a concussion. But yeah, the black box. Strangely enough, between seasons, the black box's appearance has now radically changed. Instead of looking like a portable electric fan with its cover on, now it looks like a slightly larger than usual morpher. So what does it do? It grants them Super Samurai Mode, basically their standard upgrade mode, and it actually looks quite spiffy, giving that white robe attachment. Of course, it can only be done one person at a time, and the black box is attached to their spin sword and throwing it off balance, but whatever, power upgrades. At the end of Trading Places, we catch up with Dayu. What's she been up to? Eh, wandering around a forest, apparently. In the meantime, a Nylock shows up at Master Xandred's boat named Serrator, claiming to have been at the bottom of the Sanzu River for years now, recovering his strength. You must think you're something special. Well, think again. But I want to prove my unflinching loyalty to you. Hmm. What's funny is that we yet again have a general who really should have been the main villain. He ends up with a better plan than Xandred, he's frankly more intimidating than Xandred, and he has a better voice than Xandred. Oh, and in case you didn't notice, he was also the Nylock who transformed Dayu and Decker into their current forms. I should also note that this episode, Something Fishy, actually has something interesting going for it. The monster of the day from the previous episode put Antonio's mind into a dead fish that was about to be eaten by a cat. Naturally, something horrifying like that is a bit stressful for a person, and Antonio develops PTSD for fish, even associating his barracuda blade with them and being unable to battle as the Gold Ranger. Something like that is pretty damn understandable given the lives they lead, but what's messed up is how they try to fix the problem. We won't let you quit. We all have fears. 
but we're gonna teach you how to beat them. It's called aversion therapy. Um, no it isn't. Aversion therapy is where you force someone into having a trauma by associating something with discomfort and fear. It's what happened to Alex in a clockwork friggin' orange. What Emily just said there was, we'll cure your PTSD by giving you more trauma. What they actually do is demonstrate a form of immersion therapy, and of course they do it horribly wrong since the therapy is supposed to be done over time, gradually letting the patient expand their comfort zone with increased amounts of the stimuli. You don't just shove the thing they're afraid of right in front of them unless you want them to have a friggin' panic attack. But the point I'm trying to make here is that this was 2012 and the writer couldn't be bothered to Google the right damn name! There's another problem with this plot, but I'll get to that in the character section. In the meantime, Antonio is given another locked up Zord to fix, the Light Zord. One that confuses me a bit, since all the other Zords were based on living beings, while this one is... a lamp. And in the very next episode, another power-up is granted to Jaden, the Shark Disc, which creates a Mr. Fantastic Super Stretchy Sword that goes around and hits multiple enemies at once. Also, a red version of the Super Samurai Mode. Because why not at this point? Power-up after power-up after power-up. What's next? Another Zord? The Bull Zord is escaping from the mountain! I was kidding! Oh, and this episode, The Bullzord, we not only have another horrible child actor, plus horrible adult actor, but another example of a kid who has to take on a familial responsibility just because he was born into it. You know, it's crap like this that resulted in Merrick Ishtar. And once again, we have an interesting thing that's never expounded or explained. The Bullzord, according to G, was the first Zord ever to appear on Earth, created through symbol power. We don't actually expound upon this information, although considering they say it was imprisoned for 300 years, and we know there were Zords thousands of years ago, maybe they meant the first Zord connected to the Samurai Rangers. But yeah, they don't, you know, try to learn more about past Rangers, or the nature of mechanical living beings with laser turrets on their backs. We just have have a Mega Mode upgrade, Shogun Mode. When all the Zords join together, instead of an Ultra Zord this time, they refer to it as the Samurai Giga Zord. Not sure what the difference is in the terms, but it is kind of cool. Back over to actual plot-related matters, Dayu discovers the broken-off blade of Decker's sword, thinking it means he's dead, but Serrator shows up to tell her otherwise. He offers her the chance to work for him, even promising to repair her harmonium and to be reunited with Decker. She finds him in a forest. I thought the Red Ranger destroyed you forever. My sword, Urmasa, and its power took the damage for me. For my curse to finally be broken, I need to fight the ultimate battle. What matters is that the battle ends without Urmasa being broken. Hey, come on now, Decker. Maybe you're exaggerating this whole curse thing. You know, another Red Ranger once believed that every living being had a heart. Maybe you just need someone to connect to it. With the promise of a sword getting reforged by Serrator, he agrees to work for him as well. At the end of A Sticky Situation, Serrator reveals to Decker that he was the one who gave him his cursed existence, and he doesn't care. You see what I mean about how this storyline really doesn't matter? It's just, I want to fight the Red Ranger, and nothing else to get invested in. He doesn't even want revenge. But hey, why would we want interesting stories when we could give Jaden another new weapon? A Bolzuka, just as the ancient samurai intended. Next up storyline-wise is The Master Returns, wherein the Master leaves. Huh. Anyway, we learn the backstory of how Dayu met Master Xandred. His headaches and temper used to be much worse, until somehow he heard Dayu playing her harmonium and it soothed him, so he told her to join him or die. That's it. How compelling. That story just shows how feeble your master is. You serve a weakling. Serrator admits he's been deceiving Master Xandred and that the harmonium is key to his plans. Octoru heads back to the Netherworld to warn Xandred. However, Serrator is already in the midst of his plan, arriving at some coordinates that his portable spinema thing indicates. Now, play your song of woe and create a crevice of misery so deep 
that I'll be able to slice this world in two. The Rangers attack, Serrator sending Moogers to deal with them. However, Dayu also arrives, pissed off that it's taking so long for the Harmonium to be fixed. Serrator, though, is feeling honest today with his other confession, so he admits he just wanted the Harmonium's music and doesn't give a crap about her either. She tries to fight, but really she's out of her league. Who isn't, though, is Xandred. <gasps> Day shall become night as I escape the netherworld to face my enemies! Xandred. Yep, Xandred finally got off his fat ass and arrived on Earth, but just to show how pathetic this guy is despite all the pomp and flash, he immediately starts to dry out. However, before he fully does so, a limited attack is launched and still manages to knock away the rangers. Serrator withdraws, knowing when he's outclassed, and Jaden unsuccessfully attacks Xandred. Even all the power-ups aren't enough, and Jaden gets his ass kicked something fierce. Xandred continues to dry out, but before he does, he grabs the discarded harmonium and promises to Dayu that he'll repair it if she returns and plays her music again. She agrees, and he lives up to his end of the bargain, taking a scale off his own body onto the thing, which repairs it. I'll have to try that the next time I find a broken guitar. Rub some skin on it to make it fix itself. Xandred returns to the netherworld, but because he was so dried out on Earth, he submerged into the Senzu River for an indefinite period to reverse the damage, leaving his boat ripe for Serrator to take and finish his plan, bringing us to a crack in the world. Kevin realizes that Serrator's attacks must have some sort of purpose behind them. Using their map, they realize that every one of the places Serrator has attacked or shown up forms a straight line. Jumping into action on this, and by that I mean he's friggin' fishing, Antonio runs over to- oh, Hey, Bulk and Spike, join the Order of the Claw. Good for them. Spike, I ever tell you about the time I opened a resort called Club Bulk Myers? Anyway, Serrator is ready to complete his plan, and instead of letting tension build for the audience, Octoroo spells it out. You're driving wedges of misery into the human world to split it open so you can instantly flood the Earth! However, he doesn't approve of the plan, since if done wrong, the tear could actually end up destroying both worlds, so that would be a bit of a whoopsie. What's more, he needs someone filled with both Nylock Rage and Human Misery to complete the spell, hence where Decker comes into it. Dayu tries to convince Decker to get away from Serrator, but he lives up to his word and reforges the sword for him. Oh, and it turns out this series takes place on an island, if this little demonstration of the wedge thing can be believed. I mean, maybe this is supposed to be Japan, but I tried to compare it to an actual map of Japan without success. It's not even New Zealand. Anyway, Serrator rants after installing the final wedge about how he shall rule the world and stuff, instructing Decker to finish the spell. Decker refuses, just wanting the sword back. However, Serrator claims that he figured he'd feel that way, but that he made it so that if he accomplishes the task of creating the crack between worlds, his curse will be lifted. In the meantime, the episode ends with the wedges opening and shooting energy into the sky. We pick things up in Stroke of Fate, with the Rangers thoroughly whooped from the sudden outburst of energy from the wedges. Antonio even briefly considers killing Decker, also injured from the blast, to keep him from opening the crack. You'd shoot a man in the back. Well, it's the safest way, isn't it? But he's a good guy, so of course he chooses not to. Instead, being such a great guy, he leaves the unconscious injured guy lying on broken up pieces of concrete. Decker, in the meantime, returns to the burned out ruins of the house he and Dayu shared. Nice that it's still there after 200 years. Dayu hopes that means he's got his memories back, but he admits that he feels nothing. Antonio, feeling guilty about not killing Decker when he had the chance, despite the reassurance of the others that he did the right thing, goes to intercept him on his own. Unfortunately, even Decker knows he won't attack him first, so he just walks off. But if you do what Serrator asks, millions of people will suffer a horrible fate. I knew it. You're no samurai. The other rangers save him, but yet again, they just let him walk away, even though he's already started the fight. But yeah, Decker arrives and takes his sword. Do it! Split this world open! You'll be free, and I'll be ruler of both our worlds. And so he slashes. <laughs> How could you betray me like this? You had what I wanted. Your mistake was thinking I shared your hatred of humanity. I care only for the sword. You made me that way. And without the blade to finish the job, the energy from the wedges dissipates. Serrator takes it well. 200 years of planning, ruined in an instant. Now you will feel my wrath.
Serrator is finally destroyed thanks to the samurai Gigazord, while Decker walks off, saying he'll end his curse his own way. We then head into Fight Fire with Fire, where Jaden receives a letter with the Sheba family crest on it. After reading the contents, Jaden realizes that the other rangers will finally learn his secret. Dayu returns to the netherworld while Xandrid is still recovering. She and Dr. Rue send a Nylock to kill Jaden, given special weapons designed specifically to take down the head of the Sheba clan. He's hit and injured pretty badly, but they don't hurt as much on the other rangers, so they try to defend him. He keeps begging them not to defend him like they are, but they say they have to do it, not only for the team, but for the ceiling power. Eventually, it becomes too much, and he's forced to demorph. Fortunately, he's able to deal a powerful blow to the Nylock to blast her down. However, the fact that he's still alive confuses Dayu and Octoru. If he's the head of the Sheba family, there should have been enough fire symbol power in him to destroy him. <gasps> There's only one explanation. While the rangers go into the Zords to deal with the Nylock in mega form, a figure approaches Jaden. Don't worry. I'll handle this. Thus, the Lion Folding Zord attacks and destroys the Nylock, much to the confusion of the Rangers. <laughs> Samurai Rangers, victory is ours! The Rangers pick up Jaden to bring him back to the Command House. However... Who are you? She's my big sister. Huh? Lauren, 